Welcome all. Today it's my great honor to have Miguel Bistecki with me as my conversation partner to talk about the meaning of crisis. Miguel is a professor of philosophy at the University of Warwick and he was also my doctor father. He was my PhD supervisor and a magnificent one at that too. So I'm very grateful to have him on and to be able to speak with him about the meaning of crisis, a topic that Miguel has considerably thought about. And as always, feel free to share the video, feel free to subscribe if you like, and perhaps leave a comment. And of course, also, if you can support the channel in any way via PayPal or Patreon, thank you very much indeed. I hope you enjoy the conversation. Miguel, we, before Corona, there was already much talk about crisis. You've pointed out many times that a crisis was in the news every day, almost a different crisis. And so my question would be, what is a crisis or um, how should we think of a crisis and why perhaps we can touch upon this in the conversation later on? It is that we perceive everything as crisis. Okay. Um, so what is a crisis? I don't think there's a, a straightforward answer to that question. The first thing to say, indeed, as you were mentioning, is that the word has really started to proliferate and crisis seems to be attached to just about anything. Now, I think normally when we, at a very sort of, intuitive level when we think about crisis we tend to think of an exceptional state that requires some sort of action uh, as a result but if everything is a crisis or everything is in crisis then the word seems to lose some of its meaning so even if we do have a kind of pre-philosophical understanding of it an intuitive one it seems to be uh, called into question if everything from, uh, if, of course, not to speak of the current crisis, which I think is a, is a real one, but of course, economic crisis or a, a social housing crisis or a prison crisis or an ecological crisis, uh, if the word crisis is attached to pretty much everything, then we start to think, well, what is the meaning of that word? Right? If everything is exceptional, what is, the, what is normal? So I think the the... the the philosophical task then is to try and uh, come up with a, a, be a better definition or account of crisis. And, and that's when we get into interesting but also sort of complicated territory because the, the notion of crisis itself has a sort of long history even before it enters the philosophical register. So I think an important aspect of understanding crisis is understanding the history of crisis, the history of that word, in order to arrive at, well, a proper diagnostic understanding of crisis. You know, what can we really um, identify as a crisis? And what does that entail in terms of consequences? And I, th I think that's the, the practical dimension is, is crucial. And I, ultimately, I think the notion of crisis is one that I find very... Uh, after sort of much skepticism that I'm increasingly interested in pursuing, developing and owning because it has a foot in, in theory, in the theoretical and another in the practical. And I think it points, it, it requires both at the same time, the theoretical and the practical. So I don't know if you want to talk about them, yes. the history of it or try to understand more. Yes, let, let's temporary relevance or um, yes. Let, let's spend some time on, on the history of it. Actually, um, what's I mean, you know, crisis? Ancient Greek origin, krinein, means to yeah. distinguish, to, to differentiate, um, but it's not yet used philosophically. I think for the Greeks. Yeah. So yeah, you're you're right. It has it has its roots in etymologically in the verb krinein, right, which means to to decide, but also to to, to judge. Uh, and it had in ancient Greek uh, a range of um, areas in which it was sort of developed and used uh, uh, from, from medicine to tragedy to law 
always in relation to the moment of decision. And it's really uh, in Roman times that it, it requires it's more sort of medical and is restricted to that medical sense uh, when crisis is associated with a, a form of pathology and the moment at which a disease can develop into something that is life-threatening and requires a certain sort of action uh, and a disease that can be sort of managed in a, in a sort of more, um, in, in less, I was going to say less critical sense. Um, now, in, in ancient Greece, it has, yes, it's used in, 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 a, in a religious context as well as in, 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 in tragedy. Uh, I have sort of uh, Aeschylus in mind, but also Sophocles, Oedipus of Colonus, uh, where crisis signals a sort of event that is a turning point. Right? And I think that is something that we still, at that intuitive level, retain the idea of crisis as uh, a, a turning point. And I think from there on, it, it sort of uh, developed in different areas. But in philosophy itself, it really starts to emerge um, really quite, quite late. And the reason for that, I think, is, is that philosophy is, was for the longest time concerned with the big eternal problems and with truth and constructed itself as kind of analytic of truth, concerned with the conditions of truth and how to avoid error. And so long as philosophy um, constructs itself in that way, I think there's no room for the notion of crisis. And it's only really when philosophy turns to history, uh, to history as an object, but also to its own history, that the notion of crisis starts to emerge. So I think it's only when philosophy turns into critique, not in the sense, in the Kantian sense of the first or the second or the third critique, but in more Kantian sense that of course someone like Foucault is more interested in, in the sense of historical critique, when you start asking, who are we today? And emphasize the today, what is the difference between today and yesterday. And it's in that context then that the notion of crisis uh, starts to uh, gain sort of momentum and is beginning to um, be given a more, a more precise meaning um, that I'll return to in a moment. But yeah. I think it's really in the 20th century, if we're still within philosophy itself that the notion of crisis begins to proliferate. And interestingly, when you look at the way in which it has been used, it's very often not defined in any rigorous sense. So one of the things that I'm interested in is how can crisis become a rigorous philosophical concept? Because when you think about the way in which philosophers as, as different as um, Husserl in the crisis of European sciences, or Hannah Arendt uh, a bit later on speaks of you know, the crisis of republic or crisis of democracy or crisis of education. The notion of crisis itself is very often taken for granted. It's not defined in any precise way. Mm -hmm. And there are, or for example, when Paul Valéry, who has, I think, a foot in philosophy, right, uh, talks about the crisis of spirit, l'esprit, geist, uh, at mm -hmm. the end of the First World War, uh, he also doesn't define crisis in any sort of precise way. And the only strand, I think, that tries to define crisis in any rigorous, precise way is the Marxist and post-Marxist line that identifies crisis with contradiction. And mm -hmm. it's interesting to see that the way in which, of course, this, this is articulated is through political economy and Marxist critique of political economy. So the notion of critique is, again, uh, intimately bound up in the notion of crisis, but applied to a specific area, which is uh, political economy. And, of course, the idea of an economic crisis is one yeah. we're very familiar with. 
And I think that all economists, whether classical, neoclassical, or neoliberal, um, have all agreed that crisis is sort of intrinsic to capitalism. But unlike Marxists, they believe that crisis is something that you manage within capitalism itself. Right? That's something that's eminently manageable. The difference with Marxism and post-Marxist thought is that for them, crisis is so intrinsic, necessarily intrinsic to capitalism, that it signals uh, deep contradictions that can only eventually lead to the demise of capitalism itself. And I think there you have a different conception of crisis, which goes back, I think, to our original discussion about what do we mean by crisis at a sort of intuitive level. Yeah. I think that perhaps a weak sense that we use crisis in, uh, and that has to do, I think, with a sense of a, a deviation from a norm right, that can be quite significant. So statistically significant deviation from a norm. And that, of course, can be understood as an economic crisis, but as, for example, a crisis of the NHS every year, as we know, yeah. uh, outside any pandemic, every year we know that the NHS come January or February is in crisis yes. uh, because it has a higher than general volume of uh, patients to deal with and uh, its limits are being tested. Yeah. Now, I think this is the weak sense in which I would talk about crisis because crisis is something that everyone assumes can be managed. And I think you can indeed manage deviations from the norm without calling into the normativity in question. Yes. Whereas I feel that a stronger sense of crisis, which is the one that I think, by the way, we're confronted with now, with COVID-19, is one in which, and again, intuitively, we also have that in us, I think, we think that no, the crisis is such that you can no longer speak simply of, of it as something that you can manage, as something as deviation from a norm, but that the norms themselves are being called into question. So that you also point to a future that is even more, that generates even greater anxiety because it's completely open-ended. But at yeah. the same time, I think can be seen as an opportunity, if not a demand to invent, create new norms. So I think in this idea of strong sense of crisis, I think there's built into it the idea of a possible, even necessary new normativity that needs to be, by definition, created. And I think that's also what, what uh, generates sort of anxiety. Mm -hmm. and, and so I would, on a philosophical level, try to distinguish between this weak sense of, of crisis and a more fundamental one that requires a, a moment of invention, a moment of creation. Yes, so this is perhaps what we're in, as a strong crisis, which then comes back to Krinane. We exactly. actually have to make the differentiations again. It's a proper crisis. It's decided what is and what isn't, what's right, what's wrong. It's yeah. normative in that sense. And that needs a, a reorientation of figuring out sense and what it means to be, if you like, and what, 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 it, what configures the, the good life, for example. As yeah, well. exactly, exactly. So I think you're pointing in a way to the temp the different temporalities of crisis. And I think crisis in a strong sense yes, is yes. one in which, and I think that's, that's the original Greek sense, especially in tragedy, when there's a before and an after, and, you can, and the after can no longer be like the before. Whereas again, in the weak sense, you're always thinking that things will go back to normal. And mm. I think all this, the talk that we're hearing today is, Yes, there will be an after COVID-19, although we're not even sure about that, um, but will things go back to normal? And I think most people want things to go back to normal because there's always something comfortable, <laughs> even if it's a normality that makes you somewhat miserable. There's something more comforting about a misery that you know, <laughs> a misery that you don't know, or even 
even you know the possibility of a better future but that needs to be sort of invented uh, in the first place yes i think the, the other perhaps one sort of additional comment about history and, and the sources in thinking about crisis i mean i mentioned crisis in the in the context of political economy and, and marx and even before him engels but mm -hmm. the other sort of consistent sense of crisis uh, and I mention it because it has played a role in this current crisis. The other sense of crisis that uh, historically we're quite familiar with is the one that uh, in Germany, Karl Schmidt um, developed and thematized very well, but that has led to a whole school of thought, which is crisis as indicative of the political, das Politische, as he calls it, yeah. which signals the state of exception. So crisis as an exceptional state yes. that allows the sovereign to suspend the rule of law. So yes. it's the legal procedure that allows the sovereign to suspend the rule of law, and it's in that bizarre suspension of the rule of law, bizarre in the sense of exceptional, that the political as such, right, the sovereign sovereignty as such is revealed. And in that respect, I think there is a danger in relation to crisis. To go back to the very beginning, uh, two dangers perhaps. One, if everything is a crisis or in crisis, yeah. Yeah. that can yeah. lead to complete paralysis, right? Because you don't know which crisis to attend, right? So yes. if, if everything is a crisis, then where do you start? How do you prioritize between crisis? And that has a paralyzing effect. That's, I think, one extreme. The other extreme is the one that um, we have witnessed, and I say we because it depends on which country. And yes, okay. every country has different tradition. But I'm speaking today from France, where this has come out quite clearly, and France has a kind of authoritarian streak that is always uh, about to surface. The other extreme response is one of indeed declaring the state of exception, suspending the rule of law, with the danger that the liberties that will have been suspended as a result uh, will not be regained that easily, or things will not be um, brought back to the previous stage, so that there's an erosion of liberties as a result of uh, the suspension of the rule of law. So the the other extreme danger, other than paralysis, is a form of hyperaction that goes overboard, if you will, uh, yeah. and that has a political price also that not everyone is willing to pay. And I think the fact that uh, it's a bit like the war on terror or the war on drugs. Uh, the French president declared a war on COVID-19, which is absurd, right? So the first declaration was, we are at war which many people thought that was some so some people are impressed by it and that's the whole point but others are uh, afraid of it and i think rightly so because it means a securitization of crisis it means that if you are at war against something you always reserve the right to suspend the rule of law because security is at stake and of course going back to you know, Hobbes or Spinoza or all the yeah. sort of 17th century thinkers of sovereign power. That's what sovereignty is first and foremost about, security of citizens. But in the name of security, again, uh, and through crisis, uh, things can go really quite, quite far. And in, yeah, in this case, we have an invisible enemy on top of it. Exactly. So it's, it's I mean, it's just nonsensical. Invisible. Yeah. Exactly. And, and war, at least Schmidt, I think, would not even have said that. I mean, war requires another state. You can't declare war against a virus. It doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't make sense. But it makes sense in the sense that it allows a government to do certain things that otherwise um, would not. So in the name of security. So it's, it's more, it's biopolitical war as opposed to yes. straightforward war. Uh, this is another topic you've thought about much in you know, being your last book was on Foucault, um, mm -hmm. it, it, the biopolitics in general of the new liberal state. And now it's not just security, it's health. Yeah. Health and Absolutely. idealized, fetishized uh, understanding of health. Um, that's the biopolitical ideal of, of the state. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. So I think what we have, what we have witnessed in this case, and of course, 
places like Hungary would be even be more of a, an extreme example, but is the coming together of sovereign power and biopower uh, in the face of COVID-19, right? So you declare a virus an enemy, and that requires exceptional measures that yeah. indeed amount to a further crackdown on, 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 on civil liberties and, and forms of freedom. So in, in a way, the securitization of, in, in the name of health, um, there are measures that are taken that are harmful. Yeah. But, you know, and interestingly, in, in, the, in, the, in the name of life, right? It's, it's it, in the name, in the of, name of life. saving life. And of course, exactly. one could be a bit facetious and say, we, we can't save life. Ultimately, yeah. we can only extend the quantity of years. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But it's the biopower, obviously, with the, the power yeah. of life. You yeah. can read it yeah. like this, if you like. Um, and yeah, so this is... Fascinating to see the, the prescience of 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 for cause thought here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. No, he would have been absolutely fascinated by what's happening now, indeed, because when when a when political power takes onto itself to preserve not just the security of its citizens, but extend that security to life, to their biological security, then I, f I think all sorts of uh, deviations become possible that that are not possible when citizens are not seen first and foremost as living human beings biologically living human beings so citizenship and living entities are not the same thing but i think today we, we have a, a kind of combination of, of, of both yeah and of course the the fear of the invisible enemy which led to in this country hashtag stay home yeah. Um, and now I just read yesterday on the New York Times that actually being outside is good against the virus, which is should be obvious because it strengthens the immune system to be outside and be in the sun and get some vitamin D perhaps and be active rather than be stuck at home. Um, but it's it's kind of it was a bit a strange moment of of you know being locked away in a pot, everything becoming digital very quickly. There was a deceleration in everyday life. London, a, a place we both know well, was completely empty, um, slowed down. At the same time, the digital um, accelerated. And, and something else came to bear, I think, which is that all the, the benign crisis that just so pop up every year, the, the crisis of the NHS in January, which is then forgotten in March, Mm -hmm. um, those are old. Well, then, of course, the, the more severe crisis, like the ecological crisis, economic crisis, that's been just been delayed, perhaps, yeah. um, but with new money or whatever the, the measures are. That's now all coming into one. So the, the virus is a catalyst, perhaps, for all the bigger crises and shows. It's actually it, it's ended some to some degree. That what you mentioned before, the paralysis of permanent crisis. I'm just trying to understand this because if, if we actually live in the permanent crisis bef before now, um, then it is kind of a paralysis of the behemoth of normalcy, right? Uh, which, which feeds into, we can think of this in terms of the everyday, does man, etc. But also now with this proper crisis where the, also for the first time, but the entire planet being interconnected, is also living through the same or experience um, and perhaps has to make decisions. We have to make decisions that uh, are, that were postponed, right? Because the other crises were always just postponed. There's, there's meetings about CO2 levels, but yeah. then they were postponed again. There's meetings about the financial crisis, but then there's new measures by the federal banks, etc. central banks, sorry. Um, so this perhaps now doesn't permit an ex, uh, a, a delaying of of a proper response. Yeah, well, that's. I, I think you're you're putting your finger on the what makes this crisis a one in a very deep sense, and I hope that we will be um, able to see in that way, and also in relation to which we'll be able to act accordingly. And you mentioned the ecological crisis. I think that is really the underpinning one that of course needs to be addressed and perhaps perhaps will be as as a result i mean 
I was reading today that um, in the, there's been a, a drop in sort of emissions of CO2 that, that has not been seen since 1945. And so in the, the air, <laughs> the quality of the air has increased sort of dramatically throughout the planet. Um, but will, will this crisis help us um, produce, consume, live differently. I think for me that, you know, that's, that's what's really at stake. Um, at the same time, I feel that all the money that is being pumped into the system and the measures that are taken are, have none of those sort of questions attached to them. So I'm, I'm not very optimistic in that sense. It's just a question of how can we get back to normal? So I think for most sort of politicians, um, the urgency is to try and get everything back on its feet exactly yeah. in the way that it was. So I, I don't think that it will be seized as the opportunity that I think it, it, it is. And maybe you could say a bit more about temporalities of crisis, if you like, if that's something you've, you, you'd like to dwell on a bit, because that's, to me, I think that's extremely relevant to think of time or temporality and crisis and what this means for living or yeah, existing. Yeah, yeah. I think it has to do with a moment of, um, but I think we all live uh, individually throughout our lives at different points, a moment of interruption where, where, where we think, okay, I, it, it can be as simple and, and it's, it's a real event, right? We, we meet someone. It could be a, a friend, it could be, you know, a, a, a lover, it, it can be even, a, it could be a painting. There, there is a moment of encounter um, that makes our life take a different trajectory, right? There's a point of bifurcation where we could say, you can identify the trajectory on which your life was up until then, this moment of interruption or caesura, time is, as it were, out of joint, and something happens as a result. And a different trajectory, a different life way uh, opens up. And I think crisis can be understood in that way, um, but it can also be understood, and I think it's the same temporality and the same logic of crisis uh, that someone like Kuhn, uh, the, the philosopher of science, had in mind when he wrote The Structure of Scientific Revolution, and he talks about scientific crisis. And... Uh, distinguishes between what he calls normal science and revolutionary science, right? The normal science is the science that operates within, and it's very valuable, uh, a given scientific paradigm, right? All the research and the majority of the research that is done is within a given scientific paradigm. But there comes a point when, within that scientific paradigm, science hits and continues to hit a wall or a series of walls such yes. that the paradigm itself, it feels can no longer accommodate certain data, certain phenomena, and therefore is, is in need of not just a revision, not just an adjustment, but the creation of a new paradigm. So I think this, this temporality of discontinuity, thing, right, is one that you find in our personal lives that has also been thematized in the context of the history of science, and I think applies to history in general and, and politics in, in particular. So for me, this particular crisis calls for something like a paradigm shift, to speak like Kuhn. Uh, and I don't know, and I don't know who uh, will see it in that way and decide that it is necessary to, uh, in a way, create this new paradigm. Now, of course, the interesting thing when you hear Kuhn's idea of a scientific revolution is the notion of revolution, right? Because yeah. one way in which this other paradigm has been thought of, not just in science, but particularly in politics, is through the notion of revolution. So the question is, does this other temporality require a revolution? So is the alternative temporality to the temporality of continuity, the temporality of revolution, which again, has a sort of circularity to it. And I would say that not necessarily. So I think the alternative is not necessarily between business as usual and revolution, but that paradigm shifts and 
new normativities don't require the notion of revolution. And again, the notion of revolution is like the notion of crisis. It's one we hear all mm. the time. You can say, oh, it's a revolution. So you can have a revolution within a, uh, an, inform an, an information system you know, or a revolution within uh, a way of pre pre presenting um, sandwiches, you know, in a, in, a, in, a, in a shop, you know. So the notion of revolution is <laughs> perhaps misused and abused, I think. That, that, uh, that, that just took, took me back to our conversations <laughs> at Warwick that we had sometimes, uh, some similar uh, jokes. But yes, what you pointed out, the revolution, which a grand word shouldn't be used very often. We can think of Heidegger. Heidegger says, as you know, in the Beiträge, mm -hmm. in the beginning, he says, every philosophical concept has been exhausted. Mm -hmm. I mean, to some degree, there's, to me, a bit of an exhaustion at work, perhaps, right? Crisis is a word that's exhausted. Revolution is a word that's exhausted. Yeah. Maybe we are exhausted, if you like. So <laughs> a bit <laughs> exaggerated, but uh, as a provocation, but yeah. Yeah. Well, it's always, the, I mean, it's always the case in philosophy, right? So do we, once we feel that certain words or concepts, and they're not necessarily the same thing, it's not every word is a concept, um, are exhausted, do we try to revive them in a way? And, or do we, uh, do we ditch them and then create new concepts? And I have to say that with the notion of crisis for the longest time, I was quite skeptical of because I felt that there was very little potential in it, given how used and abused it had been. Um, but uh, more recently, I have sort of changed my mind and think that it is, it is and can be a, a fruitful concept, but quite a lot of work needs to be done in order for it to be a, a good, um, useful philosophical concept. Diagnostical tool, ultimately, it's... To, how would you have you found a way of delimiting it? Crisis, yeah, so, and how would you describe it? I mean, the work I've done so far, and it's quite preliminary, but has, has been a historical on the one hand, and we talked a bit about that, right? Trying to trace its its genesis um, in those different discourses, yeah, and including philosophy, but quite late. Uh, so historical on the one hand, and more, I would say, more speculative, and also with a view to it being more practical, um, on the other. And in that respect, I see greater resources. I have to say, in I was mentioning Kuhn uh, as an as an example, or even in literature. Um, I'm thinking here of a very short text that Mallarmé um, wrote for a, a, a journal called uh, Crise de Vers, so Crisis of Verses, and in which he talks about the, the crisis internal to poetry. So one would think, okay, well, what are the ultimate consequences of that? It does seem to be very niche, very circumscribed. But the way in which he talks about the crisis of the French verse, the Alexandrin, you know, in 12 sort of uh, um, um, pied, um, and, and the way in which the, the sonnet is completely transformed as a result. He talks about it as an exquisite crisis, excuse, excuse, that requires a new invention of poetry. Right? And I think those are resources uh, for us to think about yeah. crisis as, on the one hand, something that calls for thinking. Yeah. You were mentioning Heidegger. Yeah. <laughs> uh, something that calls for thinking. Why? Because in the face of a crisis, if it's a crisis in the strong sense and not the weak sense, it means that the tools that we have at our disposal to understand it are somehow mm. called into question. So the yeah. normality of it is not just a practical normality, but it's also a theoretical one. So the tools that we develop, and it's the same with scientific concepts, mm -hmm. are concepts that allow us to understand and analyze a situation by recognizing it. So understanding is only ever recognition, right? It's something that you always already know and you recognize it as such. Whereas I think when faced with a crisis in the real sense, it's even 
a call for thinking in the sense that we, we lack the tools to understand it properly. Right? And so, again, the, the temptation is to always fall back on our, as you were saying, our perhaps exhausted concepts in order to try to understand a situation that is new or try to forge new tools, new concepts in order to understand the situation that we're faced with. So I think what's really important in crisis in the strong sense is the sense in which it calls for new theoretical tools, but also calls for a new form of action. And so I think what's mm -hmm. key there is the notion of, of novelty, the fact that you can't go back to the previous situation, both on a practical level, but also on a theoretical one. You, yeah. Yeah, no, no, go ahead. Right. You, you mentioned poetry. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And <laughs> one, one could say again a bit you know, provocatively, we, we hadn't really lived in a poetic world. Yeah, yeah. We had lived in a world of, as Joseph Pieper calls it, a world of total work, mm -hmm, the mm -hmm, totale Arbeitswelt, yeah. uh, which and maybe the, the crisis fundamental to all of this is existential or has been existential, fundamentally devoid of meaning and hence looked for uh, meaning in, for example, total work, uh, fulfillment mm -hmm. in career, etc., um, rather than in other dimensions that existence can also occupy that's just something i thought of when you said you know even new mm. poetry might be possible <laughs> new songs to be sung um yeah yeah i think to, to go back to to malami's idea of an exquisite crisis i think we've all <clears throat> well not all I, I think some of us and with with perhaps a degree of an unease if not guilt also have had this this ambivalent feeling of a form of a form of anxiety as a result of a deep disruption but also uh, an experience of the exquisite in the sense of uh, things being put on hold and us being able to look at them afresh yeah. so it has created this kind of distance uh, that is not entirely negative or entirely positive with a combination a combination of both and I think the notion of crisis um, in the strong sense has to have this it is it is both a, a, a moment of a, a moment of disruption and therefore unease and perhaps anxiety and at the same time because it is a call for something new to happen or to be thought it also has a level of excitement <laughs> built into it and in, in that respect I think the a crisis internal to an artistic paradigm or a scientific paradigm that has those elements um, built into them too. And what maybe perhaps is also fair to say is that this is a crisis that, you know, you mentioned crisis becomes with the Romans actually something that can be and should be managed. The health mm -hmm. crisis can be managed. Of course, what we're trying to do now is we're trying to manage this crisis, which reveals many crises on many different levels, because it's not just a health crisis, it actually becomes a, a social crisis. It becomes, it reveals the economic imbalances or un, un, you know, inequalities um, and brings all of that to the forefront. And at the same time, um, it's, it's also, again, as we said before, it's an invisible enemy, so-called. The virus is not visible. It's horror, ultimately. It's not ever yeah. present. It's always absent, but very present at the same time and uh we, we can't i mean ultimately there might be a vaccine etc but it's not something that usually in our everyday lives we we control we exert control over the over the world over ourselves um and now it's just there's no more control we were kind yeah, of yeah. pushed back to a realization that we can't control everything necessarily yeah, yeah. Or we control what we can. So we control populations, we control movement, we control, yeah. Um, yeah. Th those things over which we still can exercise a degree of control. I think what, what you're saying is, is really interesting in, in the sense that it, it forces us to think about the, the sort of response and therefore the sort of verb even that we attach to crisis and, and crisis response. And in this age of total management, it's not... Yeah. Uh, it's it's not a coincidence if 
crisis is are being managed and if management seems to be the one thing that we do about crisis um, when we declare war against COVID-19, then it's no longer about managing a crisis, but it's, it's, it's something that's more ag aggressive and it's, a, it's a, 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 a wrongly, I think, viewed military response or security response to uh, a health issue. But I think the question would be, well, what if the proper response to this crisis and all of the crisis that it reveals at the same time that you were talking about, and perhaps first and foremost, the ecological crisis, which is of course built um, or deeply connected with the economic crisis on modes of production and consumption. What if the proper response to that crisis was precisely not one of management, nor, which has seemed to be the alternative, that of securitization and sort of war declaration, uh, against against it that is to say neither the managerial nor the sovereign response but a response of a different kind and again are, are we as societies ready to have that sort of conversation and contemplate the possibility of a different response um, yeah, without going as far as, you know, dwelling poetically as the response, uh, but maybe, well, yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe there is, and, and I know that, again, many of us have had those moments within this moment of crisis of, yeah, of poetic sort of dwelling that, that have uh, been facilitated and in, a, in an extremely regimented, normalized, busy life is... Mm has become virtually impossible or is increasingly sort of difficult. So I think there's been, you were mentioning time, of course, yeah. one of the things that's happened, and of course, we've all <laughs> more or less experienced moments of boredom too, is this being this, being this slowing down of time. Uh, we're so used to, and have been so used to this constant acceleration of time. I think one of the things that we've also experienced is this, at a very phenological level, is this slowing down of everything. Um, which, again, some of us are quite happy with, but others perhaps less so. Yes. No, yeah, the, the, the dictatorship of the clock and of the calendar has been, I mean, not entirely. You know, we're still meeting on a Wednesday at 10 a.m. UK time to have a conversation, but it, it, there's less pressure mm -hmm, mm -hmm, just ex yeah. being exerted from the clock. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I think I think um, our, our our experience of time within because I, I was I was talking about crisis as uh, signalling kind of rupture between the between past and future as as a as a turning point as a a point which there will be will be able to recognise a before and an after but we've not really talked about or we just have now the the present itself of crisis, they say the experience of time within that moment of crisis. And I think for this particular crisis, it has translated into a slowing down of time uh, and a kind of elasticity of time or an expansion of uh, a time that, that, has, that is perhaps closer to a Bergsonian duration than the time of the clock that you were, that you were mentioning. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And perhaps ecstatic. When, yeah. When, <laughs> Yeah, which, which, which goes well with exquisite, yes, exquisite and ex ecstatic. Yes, yeah. when we all go out again and, and can meet, so it might be a quite ecstatic moment. What, if I may ask, what, what kind of response to such a crisis would you see if you were to speculate, if that's appropriate in this moment? So, I, a, a, a world, I think, in which we would, we human beings and yeah. things would circulate and travel much less. So there would be less um, mobility and a calling into question of the absurd modes of production that require for, you know, probably what I'm wearing now to have crossed you know, many oceans five times before I c actually I can wear it. And therefore, a cost to the environment. 
that need not be. So I think a way of calling to the question, as, as I was saying, our, our mode of production, consumption, motion, mobility, um, that would translate into a shift perhaps away from uh, concern for growth in the purely economic sense and towards growth in a different sense, one that requires an increased awareness of our place in the world or more importantly, perhaps on earth. So yeah. I think a, a form of ecological awareness and a transformation of lives that, um, and perhaps also uh, of, of the way in which work is, is organized on, on, a, on a daily basis. Um, so I think there are so many things that can be invented. Um, it's, it's difficult to know what form exactly they can take, but certainly I would say the ecological is definitely intertwined with this particular crisis, as well as the economic. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and it's, it's, you mentioned boredom, and as you know, the German word for boredom is Langeweile. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it, it, it yeah. didn't have this negative connotation. Yeah. Langeweile haben yeah. used yeah. to mean to, to, to finally have to Langeweile to, yes, yeah. To, yeah. But yeah. to be allotted a, a, a mm -hmm. while for to oneself yeah. away from yeah. the drudgery. And then Nietzsche points out in the, in the, in the Fröhliche Wissenschaft, in the Muse und Müßigang uh, passage. He says, you know, it used to be that, that work was considered uh, an unknowable, right? And yeah, now, yeah, now yeah. it's ignoble. And now it's, of course, it's, it's a badge of honor. Um, so, yes. Yeah, so I think f forms of, I mean, I, I know this is really one of your, your, your topics, but forms of, mm -hmm. of idleness um, that, that don't translate into yet another form of consumption, which is known as, as leisure, but a, a form yeah. of idleness that, that, that is distinguished from leisure as we understand it today. So a different, yeah, a different relation to, to time and, and space, I think is, is called for as a result of this particular crisis. When I say called for, I think it's, it's called for only insofar as I think it has already begun to manifest itself within the crisis uh, itself. And in terms of, yeah, the, I mean, we kind of, <clears throat> I mean, the, the, one of my friends uh, said to me, you know, in, in a year from now, everything will have come back to the behemoth of normalcy. Uh, I don't quite think that now because it's, <laughs> It's more massive than just the, the past crisis was 2008 financial crisis, which was just that. It was a financial crisis and attached to that, to some degree, a real estate crisis um, that made a lot of people homeless, but still it was quite contained. But now we have this extreme <coughs> catalyst of, um, of a, for the first time perhaps even in that case, a, a planetary crisis that affects everyone differently, yes, but from the same perspective. And again, it's almost like an alien force, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think this, this dimension of the planetary, of the global crisis, is yes. what most people have been completely struck by. And of course, is entirely a function of this planet has, has mm -hmm. become global and everything circulating at, at all times so um in a way we've it, it could all be also be seen as as a, a limit to processes of deterritorialization that are intrinsic to capitalism yeah. with again the threat of and this is why i'm not entirely optimistic because we've seen it already happen with threats of increased re-territorialization so yeah. the response being um, nationalism and populism as the only possible alternative to uh, the current crisis. So the only way to counter those 
deterritorializing tendencies is by retreating within one's sort of borders and not allowing and using that as a way to not allow flows of people uh, uh, especially from certain geographies in order to protect um, the, the 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 nation the sovereign sort of uh, space yeah. when we stay on on maybe you can explain a bit more because you've worked on Deleuze quite substantially mm -hmm. uh, and, and explain just the, just the theory behind what he means by re-territorialization and or is it yeah. what's, what's for what's first is deterritorialization, right is that well uh, it's a bit of a chicken <laughs> it's a bit of a chicken and egg uh, yeah. question but um, the 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 idea behind it is that um, uh, there are there is something that we can recognize as a territory uh, which is uh, a way of delimiting a space and occupying it um, but there are always whatever that space is it always generates at certain moments lines if you will that escape that territorialization and those lines can be of, of very different kinds right so uh, they can be uh, a line of, of, of thought they could be uh, they could be artistic lines but they can also be and and that is the perhaps the most significant aspect of uh, of this idea in the current context, there are lines that are associated with a certain organization of um, modes of production and social relations. And that is the capitalist um, deterritorialization, which consists in constantly shifting um, and creating new markets so that uh, what you have circulating at all times and to subordinate states themselves, uh, which are often associated with territory, to those lines of deterritorialization, all those flows of capital, those flows of goods, um, which are not extended or in a very specific way to flows of human beings or flows of population. So they require flows of population, but that are much more controlled than the flows of capital and, and the flows of, uh, of goods. So I, I, this current context, I think, is, and crisis is, is global in the sense that it, it is, uh, it, it reveals the, the extent to which our planet has been sort of deterritorialized, but it's not as if that deterioration had taken place entirely at the cost of uh, territorialization and re-territorialization. I think they work, they work together in different contexts. So if you, if you look at the American context now, yeah. uh, I think you have a very good illustration of the way in which they coexist absolutely. So you have yeah. the Trump discourse, which is one of constant re-territorialization, reclaiming of American... Um, sovereignty, independence, mm -hmm. but at the same time, without ever calling into question the fundamentals of, um, of you know, capitalism, really. So. Yeah, um, and it's. I mean, if is there anything I should should have asked, perhaps that I didn't? Uh, <laughs> no, no, I'm I'm trying to think. No, I think we've covered quite 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 a bit. Um, no, uh, yeah. I don't know, maybe you have your two, two senses to add to the future of COVID-19. Well, my, my, my standard response is otium cum dignitate. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll be like Cicero in my little garden. No, uh, no but if, 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 you, if you're happy with this, then we'll... Very good. We'll leave it at this, yes. Thanks. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much, much Miguel. Yeah. Thank you. Pleasure. All right. Bye-bye.